Welcome to Body Talk with the Student Health Center. This is part two of a three-part series. Today, we're gonna to be talking about obstacles to body acceptance. My name is Crystal Loop. I'm a wellness coordinator in the Office of Wellness and Health Promotion, and my pronouns are she and her. And my name's Emily Kerr. I'm a registered dietitian at the Student Health Center in Wellness and Health Promotion and my pronouns are also she, her. We're gonna just give you a little bit of brief information about the Student Health Center. We're located on Infirmary Road past the School of Music near Inga's at the, and the Enchanted Forest. We have three service areas, medical clinic, mental health service, and wellness and health promotion. And we offer um, telehealth and in-person appointments for those that have been screened. And you can check our website for most up-to-date info about the services that we offer. And before we get started with the content um, today, we wanna give a trigger warning. We are gonna be talking about body image, which for many of us can be a distressing topic. We'll be talking about weight, body shape and body size, as well as eating disorders. We will also be using the word fat today and asking you to remember some of your own past experiences that might be distressing. Um, we also wanna bring to this presentation our own lived experiences and um, bring those to the forefront of the discussion today. Emily and I both have our own unique experiences of living in our respective bodies. So I, Crystal, I'm a Middle Eastern cisgender female and I live in what I consider to be a larger body. And in my own life, I've experienced times of discomfort in my body and times of greater self-acceptance as well. And I, Emily, am a white cisgender female, and I live in a smaller body and sometimes experience discomfort with my own body image and also times of increased acceptance and continue to work towards ongoing acceptance. So these experiences that Emily and I have talked about um, as being our personal lived in experiences are important to note because we do have personal privileges um, for various reasons. So for myself, while I do live in what I consider to be a larger body, I still do experience privilege in my size and shape as well as my mobility. Um, also, while I identify as a person of color, I also experience light skin privilege and have had the um, experience as passing as white. So these privileges, like what I'm talking about right now, may, if left unchecked and untreated, contribute to biases or assumptions that exist among lots of different clinicians, not just Emily and I. Um, we are aware whether it's medical professionals, mental health professionals, nutrition or other healthcare professionals, gender, um, gender bias, racial bias, weight biases, and more can really get in the way of us providing accurate and helpful treatment to students and people in general. So it's our hope that as we expose some of our own biases and privileges in this series, and more importantly, invite each of you to contribute your thoughts on this process, um, that we can really talk about um, body image in a more open and vulnerable and honest way. So there will be an opportunity um, for you to submit feedback through emailing us, um, we'll give our contact information at the end of this presentation and we welcome you to do that. Thanks, Crystal, that's so well put. So um, as far as objectives in part two of this series, we'll be reviewing some topics that we discussed in part one, identifying sources of input and development of personal body image, and we'll also explore potential obstacles to body acceptance. So in part one, we discussed how body image is relevant and, influence different, and influencing different aspects of our lives. But the bottom line, chronic unhealthy body image can leave us vulnerable to developing other unhealthy coping habits. And a body image study in college students showed that 46% of participants, college participants had some degree of body image disconnect or difficulties. Research has also indicated that prevention and early intervention efforts aimed to increase body acceptance can reduce disordered eating symptoms. So talking about our challenges with body image can also improve um, our body image as well. 
And just a quick review of what is body image. Your body image is influenced by an infinite number of factors over the course of your lifetime. It is also ever-changing and may seem like it fluctuates from one day or even one moment to the next. So our goal with this program is to help identify some of the factors that influence body image and help stabilize a more healthy or balanced body image overall. Thank you for that description of body image. Again, just at the beginning of this presentation, we also want to talk about this concept called body positivity. So body positivity, as you may have heard, um, asserts that people deserve to have a positive body image, regardless of whether their bodies conform or defy societal norms and expectations. So body positivity encourages people to challenge unrealistic societal ideals and cultivate self-acceptance self-love, and the acceptance of all other bodies too. This movement in general can be really helpful to some and also transformative in, in thinking about accepting all bodies as okay or even good. Um, however, some people do find body positivity to additionally promote unrealistic expectations of themselves and others. So the reality is for many of us, we are not going to love our bodies 100% of the time, and that's okay and to be expected. We don't need to pile on additional guilt for not accepting or loving our bodies when we may already be experiencing distressing feelings about our body image in the first place. So as we move through this presentation, feel free to keep body positivity in mind, particularly if this is something that you really embrace and find to be helpful to you. If not, that's okay too. And we will talk about striving towards embracing sort of a body neutrality or acceptance. So let's discuss how our body image develops and what sources we receive input about our bodies and appearances from. So first, when we talk about our body image development, it's important to consider our personal origin stories, including factors that may have influenced us that are outside of our control. These would include any biological, congenital, or hereditary um, issues that we may have been born with or character um, traits, physical traits that we may have been born with that we didn't really have a choice um, about. So, Next, our own unique personal experiences and memories or reminders of those experiences contribute to our body image development as well, and for better or worse. So we'll talk more about exploring your own past experiences in a couple of slides, but for now, just begin to consider how some of your own personal experiences and memories of those experiences may have shaped your relationship with your body and development of your body image. Our body image is also shaped by our relationships with others and the messages we receive from those around us. This type of input can be from people that are close to you or not as close. So consider the messages that you may receive in your relationships with family, friends, mentors, or romantic partners. And not only do our relationships contribute to our body image development, but the cultures and subcultures with which we identify um, ourselves also play a huge role. So again, kind of think about the cultures and subcultures which you're a part of and think about what values those cultures might have. What are their standards of beauty, strength, or of personal self-worth? Um, and how have those standards impacted you and your own expectations of yourself or others? Needless to say, mass media and social media also contribute to how we see ourselves and feel about our appearances. We'll discuss this also more later on in the presentation, but for now, it's important to note that our visual diets, in other words, what we consume visually, impact what we prefer overall. And our personal attitudes also play a role in our body image development. And these attitudes include things um, like maybe um, attitudes of perfectionism, um, being sort of a harsh critic, and um, maybe even having traits of resilience or grit. Those things can impact how we receive input about our bodies and physical experiences. So 
again, as Emily and I talked about our own specific experiences living in our bodies at the beginning of this presentation, and we each have our own unique experiences that we can recall um, or point to as being significant or significantly impacting the way that we think or feel about our bodies and appearances. Some of these experiences can be positive um, and they may actually enhance our body image. And remembering them might bring up a sense of pride, joy, or even hope. Um, however, some of our experiences that might be more negative could bring up emotions for us like distress, anxiety, sadness, or guilt. So it may be overwhelming at times to look back in the past, past um, at some of these experiences, but we are going to ask you to do so if you feel comfortable. Think about how your past experiences have shaped your body image. You may not be able to pinpoint one specific thing or a specific experience, um, but evaluating your past experiences by breaking up so your memories and recollections into these separate time frames um, can be helpful because you may be able to actually look at your past in smaller increments it will give you a guide and you can see when the most influential experiences may have occurred. So we would encourage you maybe to consider only reflecting on one age group at a time. You don't have to reflect on each one of these time periods all at once. And don't pressure yourself to reflect on a time period if you're not ready or if it's too distressing. Also, it's important that as you reflect on these time frames, um, that you try to avoid focusing only on negative experiences. Include positive experiences as well. This may include times where you did receive positive feedback about your body or your appearance, appearance or you felt really good about your strength, your mobility, um, or another part of your personal self. You can opt to journal your responses to um, each time period, just remembering and recalling those experiences from your early childhood, later childhood, earlier adolescence, later adolescence and present. Um, or you can just think about those experiences. If you have a provider that you're already working with, maybe a therapist or another professional support person, consider asking them to walk through this with you. And as you look at each time period, these are just a few questions you might wanna consider. One, what did you look like during this time period? And really be honest, again, including any negative um, criticism you may have about yourself, as well as positive feelings you may have had about yourself or neutral um, thoughts and feelings. Two, what were the major influences on how you felt about your appearance during that time period? And then three, were there any significant experiences that you had, whether interpersonal, in your relationships, with your peers, um, or in your culture that you were a part of at the time? Cool. Crystal, I was so glad that you pointed out how important it is to also uh, reflect on the positive experiences as well, because initially hearing this exercise, my head is to kind of go to just the negative experiences but it is really helpful to include both aspects. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. All right, so there can be a variety of challenges when it comes to having a healthy body image. And here are, the, here are some of the obstacles related to body image that we will discuss. Of course, this is not an all-inclusive list. There could certainly be additional obstacles that we don't discuss within the context of this present presentation. So, Seek additional support if these obstacles are significant or if you want extra assistance navigating through them. Sometimes the thoughts or assumptions we have can be a huge barrier to self-acceptance. Here are some examples of assumptions we may have related to body image. But the first step to overcoming this obstacle is recognizing irrational thoughts or incorrect assumptions to begin with. And this can take a good deal of time and self-reflection and sometimes someone else pointing them out to us. The next step is working towards challenging or reframing the thoughts that don't serve us well. For example, I might have the assumption that my worth as a person depends on how I look, but not be fully aware of that assumption and how it really impacts my choices or habits. Becoming aware of this assumption would give me the opportunity to challenge those thoughts over time. And at some point, I could move 
to reframing the thought to my worth as a person does not depend on how I look. It might be a real realization I could come to on my own or it might require me to work with a mental health provider. Either way, it all starts with recognizing these thoughts in the first place. Another obstacle can be diet mentality, which is pervasive in many cultures, so it's not surprising that we often don't recognize it for what it is, and it sneaks up on us. The weight loss industry has an estimated worth of $72 billion. Simply put, the weight loss industry is a business. It is designed to make money. The diet mindset leads us to believe we need to be doing something restrictive to achieve the ideal body. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, I need to get back on my diet, or no thanks, I'm dieting, or ask me, can you give me a diet, because I'm a dietitian. And the strategies that I recommend support and encourage um, support and encourage healthy eating, they're, they're just not necessarily glamorous or exciting. They don't involve quick fixes or rapid results. They involve hard work over time. So we can do anything for a short period of time, but how do we sustain habits? The restrictive nature of dieting really flies in the face of a more sustainable and long-term all foods can fit goal. Personally, I'm not giving up bread, ice cream, or chocolate for the rest of my life, and there really isn't a need to unless you have an actual food allergy. Moderation is the least interesting advice I provide, but it's certainly the kindest approach we can take to the way we look at the foods we eat. There is a difference between the word diet and dieting, in my opinion. The word diet really describes what any given person, animal, or species consumes. Just what are we eating? But dieting is a verb that describes the action of restricting consumption to achieve weight loss or some other goal. Diet mentality perpetuates the concept that foods are inherently good or bad, which can be a harmful label, and we will discuss that a bit later. I think this is such a great um it's such a great thing to talk about the idea of diet mentality um, that it goes beyond just like, uh, you know, using a fad diet to achieve some goal. It's actually like a mindset and it involves us being really rigid with ourselves and restrictive. And it applies to so many things. I mean, even thinking about um, being restrictive or rigid when it comes to exercising and fitness goals too, and setting yourself up, um, you know, really for not being successful. Yeah, you know, we, we have to really think about the sustainability, like you said, and I, um, I really like the all foods fit idea. Um, I think that's so liberating. So thank you for talking about that. It's hard to wrap your head around though, initially. So it, it is, it is a challenge. Yes. So it's no secret that mass media has contributed to unrealistic appearance goals and expectations, even that diet mentality that we're talking about. Um, and media has been identified as a significant cause of body dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction particularly in women. Um, studies do show that we prefer what we see the most of. So if we see specific body types most frequently via media or social media, we will tend to prefer those body types. And if those body types don't look like our body types, then we will compare ourselves to those body types, types and naturally we'll feel dissatisfied. Um, studies examining the correlation between social media use and negative body image show that increased social media use is related to an increase in negative body image. Um, they also show that social media may contribute to problematic thoughts and attitudes about body image and physical appearance overall. So in addition to that, um, and the general trends and ideals that are promoted by the media and social media for specific body goals or body types, there are two specific trends that may be even more problematic uh, with regards to body image. Fitspiration and thinspiration. Fitspiration posts being those that are intended to serve as motivation for someone to improve their health and fitness, and thinspiration being um, posts that serve as motivation for someone to lose weight or change their body shape and size to become thinner. 
while the intent behind both Fitzbo and thin, Thinspo posts, um, specifically Fitzbo posts, may be good to exercise, become healthier, eat well, and take care of our bodies, these types of posts may actually increase our body's dissatisfaction and disordered eating and fitness behaviors. Um, again, kind of going back to uh, comparing ourselves against what may be an unrealistic or unhelpful standard. One particular study on Fitspiration and Thinspiration posts across Instagram, Tumblr, and Twitter um, did conclude that both both types of posts, so Fitspo and Thinspo, emphasize what is a fit and thin body. And this does contribute to viewers of these images focusing on physical appearance, um, sexual su suggestiveness, and restrictive eating in pursuit of this fit and thin body ideal. Crystal, I wanted to mention here, since you were talking about Thinspo and Fitspo, I had a, a particular example that popped in as a student that I worked with that recently was sharing with me um, a friend of hers that was posting pictures on social media about her weight loss journey. And while that was a really positive experience for her friend, for herself, she found herself feeling really bad about herself, that she wasn't in that same place, and that she felt like she was doing something wrong and mm -hmm. felt like she's tried so many things to get her body to look a certain way and felt maybe even kind of pressure to like maybe be doing what her friend is doing instead of really kind of following her her own path in that journey so it's it's just such a challenge in some ways um and that was just an example that i wanted to share that felt fit in here yes thank you for sharing that again you know there's that saying that comparison is the thief of joy and really comparison is the thief of so many things you know that joy that we feel um about our bodies um body image acceptance i think it applies there too so that was a good example um so as we talk about this thin body ideal it's important that we also talk about fatness um, and the fear of gaining weight or getting fat. Um, I have to be transparent. And when I say this word, it really just irritates me. You know, this is a trigger word for me. Um, but I will continue to talk about this because it's so important um, that we notice this as an obstacle to our body image development and acceptance. So um, I'm going to actually read the graphic just because it will reiterate to me that this, you know, this is not necessarily a bad word, um, but you are not fat, you have fat. You also have toes, you are not toes. So um, I love that graphic because it is, again, it's very liberating. It puts fat in its place. Um, fat is not an identity. Um, it is, it's a noun. It describes something that is part of your body or on your body, but it's not who we are. So we also have bones. We don't say, oh, I'm so bones. Exactly. Exactly. That's so true. <laughs> I might start saying that, though. I like it. <laughs> um, so fat phobia is a term to describe this overarching fear of gaining weight, um, changing body shape and size, and or being around people living in larger bodies. Fat shaming involves um, when a person or people judge, criticize, or demean another person who may be in a larger body for simply existing um, and accepting or embracing their body at that size. It's important that we explore our own body image um, and that we consider how fat phobic thoughts or messages may impact us personally. So think about whether you have any biases against gaining weight. Uh, do you have a problem if your body changes shape and size? I know I can say, yes, I struggle with that. Um, what do we think that means about us, though, as human beings, if this happens, if we gain weight and our bodies change shape and size? And what does this mean about other people whose bodies may be larger than ours? Um, and as their bodies change, does that mean that they change as well? If we're afraid of gaining weight or fat on our bodies, how does this fear impact our thoughts and feelings about ourselves and the choices that we make? So going back to that diet mentality that um, Emily was talking about, do our fears of fat or fatness affect our eating habits, our fitness habits, our enjoyment of relationships? And if so, is this fear something that we may need to work through? 
again, clinicians are guilty of working from this framework too and perpetuating body size or appearance discrimination. Um, and ultimately that discrimination is rooted in fat phobia and thinness as the ideal body type. This automatically stigmatizes people in larger bodies and does imply a negative connotation to growing in size and shape, which again, can hinder us from having body image acceptance or body positivity, if that is something that you embrace. Okay, so another challenge is relationship dynamics. And the relationship dynamics that we experience with the people in our lives varies greatly and can range from feeling supported to feeling criticized. Feedback about appearance isn't necessarily negative, although it can be. Some folks offer unsolicited feedback that they might not perceive as negative, but might be received as negative. And some people do, in fact, make very critical comments about appearance, and this can be particularly challenging, especially for individuals who struggle with body image acceptance. Some folks struggle with healthy boundaries and feel inclined to offer feedback, even if it's unsolicited or unwanted. It's important to learn to identify those behaviors from others. And though you cannot control what others say or do, you can work on setting healthy boundaries to protect yourself from being on the receiving end. How, how to deal with food pushers or unwanted comments. Um, so we also might need to recognize if we have some distorted perceptions about how we interpret input from others. For example, are, are we sometimes reading too much into things? But I love the quote on this picture as well. The body, our body really isn't up for discussion. Um, and it seems like there are lots of, at least in my experience, lots of people that feel like um, it is. It is a point of discussion when really um, you need to check in with people. Some people don't mind it, um, but you don't really know where someone stands or what state of mind they might be in. So it's better to not really have to be a point of discussion. I, this is one thing that I like respect and love about you as a person and a professional um, is that you really do a good job of setting boundaries around um, your plate and your body. And it's something that, you know, I think is so important for us to know is an option. If you, if you don't necessarily know how to set those boundaries, that's an option for you to learn how. I know for myself, you know, I grew up in a family um, where we, there's a lot of women in my family. We're very vocal. We spend a lot of time together. And a lot of that time is spent in dressing rooms. Um, we love to shop. And I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've received the feedback of like, oh, that, that dress looks really good on you, but you need to put some spanks on. And, you know, over time that became really normal to me. And there was a time in my life where I knew if I was going to purchase a dress, I needed to prepare that I was going to wear my Spanx with it, you know, kind of keep that tummy tucked in. And um, that was just normal. It's taken time for me to realize that that really is problematic for me personally to feel like I can't wear a dress without wearing a really uncomfortable undergarment. I hate Spanx, like they're not comfortable. I do, however, love a nice like bike short under a dress that is comfortable. It helps with the chub rub, you know, with my thighs. So I'm okay with that. But I, I do not wanna have to limit myself to wearing an undergarment um, when I purchase a specific piece of clothing because I feel like my body as it is is not acceptable to myself or to other people. And I, I love, thank you so much for complimenting me. I, it made me think about um, a, an example that I think is relevant here of like, because I am a dietitian, sometimes people actually, um, feel the need to explain to me what is on their plate or like be explain to me their eating habits or if they're eating something that they consider quote unquote bad, they almost need to feel the need to justify it in front of me. And I really try to let people know, look, you do you, I am not, I'm really not paying attention. Honestly, mm -hmm. you're got my, my plate full, so to speak, but uh, that's, I think, a good example of sometimes how we're assuming that someone is making judgments when maybe they're not. But I also think it's completely fair to say 
there are times when people are making a sum, uh, judgments um, and that is like, you know, warranted to have like feelings of being judged. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, it really is a, it's a, a place that takes a lot of time and skill to develop confidence to be able to handle those situations in a way that feels authentic to you. Definitely. Yeah. That's a great Thank point. You for sharing your story as well. Of course. And if anybody needs tips on some good bike shorts, you're their girl. Let me know. My email address will be at the end of this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so another challenge or obstacle, distorted thinking. So when we label foods as good or bad, and I hear this a lot in my nutrition counseling sessions, um, when we do this, we limit the ability for context. We also tend to place judgment on ourselves when we eat those good or bad foods and then have associated feelings of guilt or shame when we consume those bad foods, right? We're like, I ate a bad food, therefore I am bad. Um, but challenging these labels can be helpful in reducing self judgments and creating a space for an all foods can fit approach, which is my favorite. Mm -hmm. And approach leaves room for context. And it also takes a lot of work getting there. I can honestly say, I have not always easily been able to embrace the all foods can fit mentality, but it is my jam now. Um, so I find it helpful to think about it in this way. I love ice cream. It is one of my most favorite foods in the world. And if I ate ice cream for most of my meals and ate large quantities of it, my diet would lack adequate nutrition, balance, and quality. However, if I can consume ice cream moderately and drop that, that label of that's a bad food and, and incorporate it in moderation like once or twice a week and follow the recommended serving sizes, more or less, I can include a food that I truly enjoy and not feel guilty about it or not feel shame about it. And that that, like you said, that feels so liberating to be like, what? I can have ice cream and not beat myself up about it and also feel more in control as well because it's not something that I've had to restrict or deprive myself of. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as, if I label it as bad and don't allow myself to have it, at some point I might be exposed to ice cream and lack control and overconsume it versus allowing it in moderation. So the more we restrict ourselves, the more we think about it, and that leaves us more vulnerable to overdoing it or even potentially binges. So it's more about our habits and relationship with food than the actual food itself. Also, all or nothing thinking is not limited to food. We touched on this a little bit earlier, Crystal, when you talked about um, exercise. Um, it can be a complicated relationship to think all or nothing um, with a relationship with exercise. I've definitely worked with clients who feel like they have to exercise to justify eating, when in reality, it's the other way around. Our bodies have to have energy just for basic survival, and our energy comes from the source of food. So we don't want to not only survive, we want to be able to thrive. And some individuals feel guilty if they don't exercise. Mm. Um, some folks also feel a sense of accomplishment or generally feeling good when they experience physical hunger. This is something I've heard a lot too in the work I've done um, with some of my eating disorder clients. And it is um, a process to really recognize physical hunger as a cue to eat and not necessarily a bad thing. It's the body's way of communicating a need. And again, recognizing and challenging, reframing thoughts can really be a helpful tool here. Hmm. Rituals are another potential obstacle, and oftentimes we engage in behaviors strictly out of habit without really thinking about the why. Um, like for you, Crystal, thinking about how, you know, oh, I just automatically did Spanx, that was like automatic protocol, and then you begin to question that why. So some of our habits might actually do more to reinforce challenges with body image. So for example, if we experience weight gain or weight gain, or maybe even just be dissatisfied with our current weight, we might rely on food restriction to try and control that weight. But for some people, they might restrict during the day only to set themselves up for a binge later that evening because of true physical hunger. 
which in turn can lead to shame and guilt um, because there was an actual physical need there. And then might trickle into the next day of starting that cycle again of restricting during the day and then hitting that wall again from a physical standpoint and then binge again. And the cycle just kind of keeps on going. All of this can actually reinforce the ritual as a way to seek and find relief from the discomfort or the distress. I love that you're talking about this and I can think about personal experiences um, where I have felt like, you know, I need to restrict workout and then I can like maybe indulge a little bit. And you're right. That leaves me feeling like, unenergized for the workout and I am starving, you know, after the workout and I end up eating probably more and like, you know, just different foods than I would have eaten had I just really like, you know, that hunger. Yeah. Yes. If I would have just taken my care of myself. The goal is not to be starving. That there's no like there's there nobody's holding handing out medals for that for sure. <laughs> yes. I also think it's important to think about like the um the obstacle of mirrors in general. So I mean, I'm not like pushing anyone to, you know, refrain from looking in the mirror, especially if you enjoy looking at yourself, like do it, you know, enjoy yeah. it. Um, but sometimes we can really become obsessive about checking ourselves, whether it's our facial features, it may be our hair, um, or it could be certain parts of our bodies. You know, I've worked um, with a client in the past that was purposefully um, refrained from having a full length mirror in their home because they did not want to see their body from the waist down. And, you know, that, that may have been a good decision for them based on them being aware that it was a trigger. Um, but also if that is an issue for you and you really struggle with hyper-focusing on specific body parts or your body in general, then we encourage you to seek support because um, body acceptance, you know, again, or even neutrality, being able to see your body in that mirror and not experience such distressing thoughts really would be, you know, so much um, goal. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a, a great example too of where you might avoid that trigger, but the long term goal would ultimately be to be able to see that and not feel triggered by it. But that might not be where you are at the beginning of your work. So, absolutely. Process in that and the strategies that you take can evolve over time based on where you are in that process. Definitely. And that kind of brings us to our current slide, which is if you want to make changes, we want to try to equip you um, with some resources and ideas for you to begin doing so. So like Emily said, the goal of these um, body talk presentations is really to help you identify where you are currently, because wherever you are, it is, it's okay to be there and you can start making goals where you are. Your goals don't have to look like anybody else's. Um, so as we talk about setting goals, it's important to set SMART goals. These are goals that are um, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time sensitive. A lot of times we may be inclined to set a really vague long-term goal of like, I, you know, I want to lose weight. Well, let's, let's, let's take another step. You know, are you experiencing distress about your body? Is that impacting your goal to lose weight? If so, can we talk about maybe addressing the distress? Or if you do have the goal to lose weight, um, can we talk about a specific goal that may also not interfere with your body image? So uh, trying to maintain a posture of compassion to yourself as you set these goals and try to achieve them is really important. So we encourage you to use self-compassion if you'd like to start making any changes. And this means treating yourself as you would treat a friend. So being gracious, kind, and reminding yourself that as you make whatever changes you'd like to make, you are strong, you're resilient, you're beautiful, and you're worthy. 
Mindfulness is another great pra a practice to um, begin making changes. And this is something that can be incorporated into your daily life and your body image work. Mindfulness involves focusing your attention on being present in the moment and refraining from judgment. And practicing mindfulness is like any other exercise. It does take time, um, but it is a great way to start tuning into your thoughts, feelings, and surroundings while also letting go of judgments that you may have about yourself, about your experiences, and about the world around you that may uh, try to interrupt your peace. So if you've noticed that you've struggled with any of the um, barriers or obstacles to body image that we talked about today, and specifically some of those appearance assumptions um, or issues with your thought patterns and perceptions of yourself, then we encourage you, one, start checking in with those thoughts. Maybe jot them down, journal them if that's helpful to you. But if needed, always seek additional support and guidance from a professional, including staff at the Student Health Center. We also want to leave you with these resources, um, which may assist in exposing some problematic trends um, or enhancing your visual diet and giving you some support as you make some changes and overcome some of these obstacles to your body image development. So we have some um, Instagram accounts as well as some co uh, companies that you can check out online, maybe follow their um, Instagram or other social media handles and really start to address your visual diet like we talked about earlier in the presentation. Maybe diversifying your feed so that you're able to see different body types, different types of physical appearances um, so that the expectations that you have really reflect the diversity of humanity. The good and bad news is that, um, you know, again, we, we will prefer what we see the most. So consider diversifying your feed where you can and where you can't, we encourage you to curate your own account. And so um, if you really feel passionate about diversifying other people's feeds and showing your, your body and um, your appearance as a way to promote your own healing and the healing of others, then go for it. Um, that I've seen lately, Crystal, that I'm kind of noticing a slight like trend or change in is um, especially celebrities postpartum are starting to share pictures of their bodies that are way more realistic of what it looks like after you have a baby versus like this fresh, I'm sure that they experience to have this perfect body and bounce back immediately after having a baby. But I've I feel like I'm starting to notice a little shift in some celebrities with that. So I think that's really cool. Yeah, for sure. And I noticed something that I noticed that was a little bit different. I think, you know, I've tried to really practice like incorporating um, different body shapes and sizes into my social media feeds. But I noticed um, recently some accounts that were um, really normalizing things like, you know, body hair, um, you know, pimples and acne as being like normal parts of being human and really not like editing those things out. So even facial hair on women. Um, and I just, that was a good wake up call for me because it was something that I know I need to also include in my feed to remind me that like, you know, if, if I have pimples or acne or, you know, if my facial hair is showing like, guess what? It's because I'm human. And there are other people who, you know, are, are living in bodies that look like that as well. Um, and so, yes, whether it's celebrities or just other, you know, other people on social media are creating your own account where you can reflect that. I think that's excellent. Um, and again, um, as far as like some of these companies that we have listed, not only does that help diversify your feed and change your visual diet, but also, you know, if you're shopping for articles of clothing, it is, um, it's nice to see people that may look like you when the trend may have been a certain body type that did not look like yours. And you actually can see how the clothing might look on a body similar to yours. Um, so that's really helpful. And um, lastly, you know, we included some films and books. The Body Image Workbook is one that's going to be woven through all three parts of this series. So if you're interested in getting that book and maybe working through it with a um, professional, we encourage you to do so. Um, as we talked about celebrities, Billie Eilish released a, a short, very short film recently um, about 
her body uh, really not not being um, it being her responsibility and not uh, not necessarily being something that other people should really contribute uh, about as much. And, um, you know, also considering, um, I wanted to kind of talk about just other celebrities who maybe are normalizing different traits. When we talk about like uh, our black community, I think about Beyonce and her releasing Black is King. That's something that um, we really, we can include this on here. Um, but that film is something that celebrates Black African beauty, um, from the aesthetics to the hair, makeup, and wardrobe. Um, and it really celebrates this idea of Blackness. And so as we talk about body image, again, we're talking about physical appearance. It may be um, skin color, hair texture, and things like that. Um, so just think about the celebrities that really you connect with, that you identify with, and um, Yes, we encourage you to look them up and follow them. Good, next slide. Next slide. All right, so if you have any questions, please feel free to email us directly. Um, if you would like to schedule an appointment with the Student Health Center, you can call 225-578-6271, or you can visit our website listed here, lsu.edu slash SHC. And I think that's it. Thanks for joining us.